The topic today is pest management, or pests and their, and their management. Now, um, there's a certain uh, tendency in agroecology to not recognize pests at all. The, the sort of the idea that everything has a place in nature and so we really shouldn't be judgmental. But um, I, I, I think that uh, these little bunnies over here, if you're trying to grow lettuce, at least in the place where I live in Ann Arbor, Michigan, trying to grow lettuce, these things are not, um, they're, they're pretty pesty, okay? And if I'm trying to grow tomatoes, as a matter of fact, uh, these guys are pretty, pretty, pretty pesty. So I would say that uh, for me personally, there are pests in agriculture, and I think most farmers actually believe that also. So the question is, when you're doing agriculture, or for that matter, if you're just doing ecosystem, if you're doing ecosystem management, of which agriculture is just one, one form, uh, you're concerned with things that are getting in your way of doing what it is you want to do with your ecosystem management. We'll call those pests. And we're gonna deal today with uh, how we manage those pests. As is so frequently the case, a historical examination of a subject can give us tremendous insights into the way that subject happens to the, the way that subject uh, plays out today and what we might actually do about it. In the case of uh, the control of pests and diseases, uh, I've taken five sort of classic situations that have had a major impact on in the world in the past. First of all, we have the coffee rust disease, which broke out in Ceylon, uh, today we call it Sri Lanka, in the late 1800s. Ceylon was a British colony, and the British had planted enormous monocultures of coffee. And when this disease broke out, there was a tremendous effort to try to figure out how to control it. Never was successful. Eventually, basic, eventually coffee had to be abandoned on the entire island of Ceylon. Um, it was a devastating, uh, a devastating uh, uh, effect on the British Empire. Second of all, we have the... Uh, the Irish potato famine. This uh, sculpture here on on the docks in uh, in, in Dublin is really quite an emotional uh, emotional uh, sculpture depicting what happened when the potato famine hit. Potatoes, don't forget, at that time were basically the poor people's food, and the potatoes easy to produce and uh, providing a tremendous amount of carbohydrate led to a population explosion of people in Ireland. And when the potato crop failed, it was devastating. People starved, people migrated out of Ireland. This was caused by uh, a disease which is related to fungi. It wasn't really a fungus, but it was related to fungi. The point is that there was a monoculture of potatoes that uh, the, an, an entire population was based on this one monoculture of potatoes. When the disease hit, well, it was an absolute well, it was an absolute disaster. The next example uh, is from California. <clears throat> in California, accidentally, a scale insect, the cotton, cottony cushion scale, was introduced from Australia and became an, uh, had a devastating impact on the citrus industry in California. Uh, in what would, be, what would become a classic way of dealing with pests, entomologists went to Australia and figured out what it was in Australia that controlled the cottony cushion scale. And it turned out there was a beetle called the Vidalia beetle that uh, seemed to be a major predator. And they, so they brought the Vidalia beetle back to California and it proved to be a, an effective, a relatively effective control agent for that particular pest. Uh, the fourth and fifth examples are about grapes, uh, about wine grapes in, in Europe, uh, especially in France, but, but all over Europe. Phylo phy <coughs> Phyloxera is this very, very small insect uh, and you can see it on the bottom, on the bottom slide here. Uh, uh, you can see the, the the effect that it has on the leaf. Those are galls that are formed around the uh, around the the, the, the small aphid-like organism that exists there. It has its major effect, though, on the root system. Uh, when they attack the root system, they cause the plant to wither and die. It became a huge problem uh, in France. The way it was solved, uh, I should mention that the phylo phy phyloxera came from, uh, came from the United States. And in the United States, wine varieties uh, had a partial resistance to this insect, and so it wasn't that big of a deal. But when it got to France, uh, it was a, 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 tremendous, uh, a tre tremendous burden to wine producers. The solution was to bring rootstock from the, uh, the United States, which was relatively uh, which uh, <clears throat> was relatively resistant to the phylloxera, uh, graft it to the to the tops of the of the of, of the French wines, uh, 
and use that effectively a hybrid, not really a hybrid, it was a graft, but more or less the same principle, it's a hybrid. Hybrid. So you had the good French wine producing on the top, and you had the phylo phyloxera resistant roots on the bottom. Ironically, the next big problem apparently came along with the rootstocks that were brought from, the, from North America, and that is a sooty mold that <coughs> expanded over the tops of wine grapes. It's all, this is in the 19th century. To solve this problem, uh, a, a, a wine grower noticed all of a sudden that the only parts of his vineyard which were not affected by this sooty mold were the parts right next to the roads. And the part right next to the roads, he had <coughs> concocted a mixture of copper sulfate and lime, which is sort of uh, bluish in color, which was sort of bluish in color, and he had applied that to the grapes uh, along the road because people traveling along the road uh, kept stealing his grapes. And so he figured if he, if he would put that mixture on the vines, it would look so bad that nobody would want to steal them. Uh, it turned out that uh, the, those vines that had been treated with this, what was then, which, which was called the Bordeaux mixture, it still is called the Bordeaux mixture, uh, <clears throat> turns out to be a fungicide. The copper sulfate part is actually a fungicide. And so the way that that one, uh, that problem was dealt with was effectively by finding a poison, sort of accidentally finding a poison that would take care of it. So we have these five major historical events, each one of which has, a, has kind of a message for us. Uh, uh, the Irish, Irish potato famine in the 1840s, grapes and powdery mildew in France in the 1850s, a fungus spot disease in coffee, the rust disease in coffee in Ceylon in the 1870s, the grape phylorexa in the 1860s in, in France, and uh, the cottony cushion scale in California in the 1860s. Uh, this led to sort of, sort of the basic strategies that you can think of when you think of the strategies normally used to deal with pests in, in, in agriculture. First of all, abandon the crop as they did with coffee. Now, in a sense, that seems like, like you're just giving up. Well, yeah, and, but so, and sometimes that makes sense. The tomatoes in my front yard where, I have a, where we have a, a small garden, uh, several years ago they were attacked by this Phytophthora, the same, the same organism, uh, well, a related organism to the one that attacked the potatoes in, in, in Ireland. And it gets in the soil, and it more or less stays in the soil. And it, it's well known now, if you grow tomatoes there again next year, why they're not going to grow. So we basically abandoned tomato production in our front yard, and we now produce tomatoes in our backyard. Uh, so it's uh, sort of abandoning a particular crop that has a pest problem is not necessarily uh, sort of giving up. It's not a bad solution. Now, when you have crops like coffee, uh, or cacao or apple trees or something like that. Apple orchards, well, they, uh, that's a pretty big investment there to be abandoning it, but sometimes it's the only thing that you can do. Uh, the development of resistant varieties, which is what they eventually found, eventually solved the problem in Ireland, in Ireland at, least for the, at least temporarily. Uh, and then the grapes, which had, had the artificial resistant variety with the grafting that they had, um, that's, uh, that has been a, a a way of dealing with pests uh, historically, and it's still a valid way of dealing with pests. Finding a poison, and this is an example of the Bordeaux mixture for the powdery, for the powder, powdery uh, mildew, that, uh, I mean, that is a solution. I mean, the way we've gone with the pesticide uh, treadmill and the pesticides that we use in modern uh, industrial agriculture right now is not to my liking, and it's certainly not part of the agroecological program, but nevertheless, it's something that exists and it's something that does exist. Uh, finding a natural enemy, as happened with the grape phylloxera and uh, cotton cushion scale. I didn't mention the grape phylloxera, but that's one of the, one of the ways that it was dealt with, in addition to the grafting. Um, but that, uh, that's, uh, that's a relatively common thing to do. That's what we refer to as classical biological control, looking for a particular natural enemy that will take care of the take care of the pest problem, uh, and then then will be a thing called enhanced autonomous control. And that enhanced autonomous autom autonomous control takes advantage of the fact that in nature pests aren't normally under control, autonomous in the sense that the natural system itself is what's creating the management system. Now in this lecture, I'm going to be talking about, about um, macro pests, okay? And the lecture that follows this one, I'll be talking about micro pests. Micro pests are basically 
uh, plant pathogens, okay? Then the macro pests we have, as I mentioned before, we have, you know, here's the example with the rabbit in the, eating the lettuce or the tomato hornworm eat, eating, eating, eating the tomatoes. As we all know, uh, this is a, a, a predator of, of rabbits, and he may look really nice and cuddly and furry to us, but as far as the rabbit is concerned, he's really quite the natural enemy, this predator. And then over here, we have a little braconid wasps. These are parasitoid wasps that attack the, the uh, manduka larva. The female wasp comes to the larva and she lays eggs on the surface of the larva and the eggs hatch and the larva crawls into the, the wasp larva crawls into the caterpillar larva body and eats out the body and when they get ready to, ready to, uh, <clears throat> ready to pupate and get into the adult form where they create these little cocoons on the outside of the surface of the of the caterpillar. It's very common to see these in nature. Uh, this is an example of a parasitoid that uh, keeps, uh, that can keep, keep, uh, uh, keep all sorts of insects under control. And here is another example. This is a pathogen. Uh, this is uh, an example of a, uh, it may, maybe not look, like, not look like a tomato hornworm, but this is a tomato hornworm that's been devastated by a virus. Uh, it's called a polyhedrosis virus based on its particular morphology. And this is the kind of thing that you see happening in nature all the time. So what we have is we have of these natural enemies, we have predators, we have parasitoids, and then we have um, microorganisms, or you might call them diseases, I guess. And these can be, they can be fungal, they can be bacterial, uh, or they can be viral. I've been doing research in coffee uh, agriculture for the past, past 20 years, and in Mexico and Costa Rica, a little bit in Nicaragua also, and uh, I've discovered all sorts of things, uh, especially just making casual observations in nature. When I first started working in Mexico, for example, on the farm that we worked on, just through sort of casually walking around the farm, I began collecting uh, insects that I saw eating coffee leaves, okay? Uh, and without really doing anything systematic, without, without attempting to find things, uh, I encountered somewhere between 25 and 30 different species of insects, caterpillars, beetles, etc., that were eating coffee. This is a very, very, this, this is not unusual, okay? To find lots of herbivores that will uh, take advantage of a particular plant. Now, the thing that, uh, uh, the, the thing that impressed me most about this was of those 25 or 30 that I had seen, uh, <coughs> None of them were regarded as coffee pests. And the reason they weren't, uh, I think it's pretty obvious. It might not even, it, it might require further investigation to make sure that it's true, but I think it's obvious. You take, for example, this group of caterpillars here, when I brought them into the lab, guess what happened? Two or three days later, disappeared. These are those same, the same kinds of Parasitoid wasps that uh, that uh, that uh, that uh, that engage them, and this one here, which is similar to the tomato hornworm, a couple of days later, this is what appeared. This is the polyhedrosis virus. So, what you can what you conclude from this, or what I conclude from this, is that in nature, all plants in nature have in nature have herbivores. Very very frequently, they have multiple herbivores. There are some plants that are really, really famous for having hardly any herbivores, but just one or maybe two. But most plants in general have a lot of different herbivores. That's a, that's a first basic principle of the way nature works. But a second principle of the way nature works is that herbivores generally face the same problem. Herbivores have multiple natural enemies. I believe this leads us to an inescapable conclusion, and that is nature normally regulates pests. So can we read nature's message and construct a system of autonomous pest management? Um, nature does not usually have pests. That means that autonomous of our participation, why nature is controlling the pests. Can we construct an agroecosystem that does the same thing? Can we use the science of ecology to help read nature's message or messages? Uh, why are pests not pests, or why are potential pests not pests? And the example here with the coffee caterpillars that I that I gave you that I that I mentioned before. And finally, 
can traditional knowledge help in our design? What the traditional agriculturalists, if they still exist, what they understand about what, their, uh, what pests exist in their, in their system. And this leads me to, uh, to, uh, to a, a, a conclusion that these days are, many people are referring to as the Morales effect. This is Helda Morales, the one on the left. And uh, she is a Guatemalan entomologist. And she had a particularly interesting, uh, particularly interesting experience when she was doing her PhD dissertation. The plan of her dissertation was she was going to interview, interview Guatemalan traditional farmers uh, in the highlands of Guatemala. And she was going to ask them, what kind of pests do you have? And then when they told her why she was going to them, because she's basically an entomologist, not really an anthropologist doing interviews. And she was going to take, uh, she was going to ask them how they control their pests. And, and she was going to see if she could sort of, uh, un, sort of understand from a biological, ecological perspective how that, uh, how, how that was functioning, what the basic underlying scientific rules were involved in what the farmers were doing. So she began by asking the question, uh, what pests do you have? And the answer was, we don't have any pests. So she went to some other farmers and she said, what kind of pests do you have? And they said, we don't have any pests. So she went to some others and she said, what kind of pests do you have? And they said, we don't have any pests. Now you can imagine, here's a, <laughs> a PhD graduate student who's attempting to create a, a PhD thesis out of the proposition that peasants control their pests in ways that may make sense from a biological, ecological point of view. And her first, her, her first goal was to find the pests that they were dealing with. And they all said, we don't have any pests. Now, <laughs> that's a problem. And so uh, Dr. Morales got, uh, got all depressed, but she decided she would, she had a bright idea. She said she would change the question that she asked. So instead of, instead of asking the question, uh, what kind of pests do you have? She reformulated the question and she asked, what kind of insects do you have? Now it turns out that uh, the answer to that question was really complicated because they had all sorts of insects and they understood all these things. They, they knew what the insects were. They knew what the insects did. And so she suddenly started accumulating a wealth of information about insects that existed in the, in, in, on the farm, right? Now she took the normal entomological uh, description of insects that attack corn plants, that attack maize in Central America, and guess what? Things listed as pests in the, in, in the book, things listed as pests in the book, were overlapping tremendously with the things that the campesinos said were, uh, were insects in their farm, those same farmers that said, uh, well, we don't have any pests in our farm. So of course the question that she began to ask then, and this was the basis of her PhD thesis ultimately is, how come pests are not pests? Or of course, how come insects don't become pests? And what are the, what are the circumstances under which they, they don't become pests? So what you had here was, uh, you would call it, I think formally speaking, you, you would call it uh, cases of autonomous management of potential pests or what I refer to as the Morales effect, since Helda Morales was the one who did the sort of this classic study to find out that the way it was working. Reflecting on uh, a previous lecture then, what we have here is a system of the Highland Guatemalan farmers basically saying that we manage the farm in such a way that it remains healthy, that we have no pests on the farm. This is to be contrasted with the alternative way of dealing with pests is <clears throat> we we vanquish the we vanquish the pests on the we vanquish the terrorists on the battlefield of agriculture. So back to these basic ideas that I presented before, we now see that we're presented in general in pest control. We're bas basically presented with two fundamental situations that present themselves to us. On the one hand, pests may be persistent but relatively unremarkable. And if that's the case, we 
presume that they are under some kind of autonomous control from the natural system that exists in the area. And our job at that point, I would argue, our job is to try and figure out why they could be pests, but they're not. This is anticipating the future. Pests are always regarded as new and surprising. Uh, to an ecologist, of course, it's not surprising that they're constantly uh, developing new pests in a system as we develop new kinds of agriculture, as the pests evolve into being able to eat different kinds of things. So when pests are not really a problem, when they're not really all that remarkable, is precisely when we should be studying them. We should be trying to understand what are the conditions whereby they're not pests, okay? But there's a second and, uh, and obviously uh, important situation that needs to be taken into account, and that is when pests are epidemic, and they, and they threaten to destroy the farms. Uh, and at this point, we have to use all the tools that are available to us. In the agroecological sense, we need to use the, the you know, sort of that combination of tradition, science, and nature, and collective action. That's uh, the four pillars of agroecology. And we have to put into place all the tools that we have available to us in the agroecological system to try to solve the particular problem that actually does exist. Now, frequently, <laughs> there is no solution. And which I think it's important to admit when there is no solution. But agroecological principles can, can very frequently, and the his, history has shown that agroecological principles, using basic rules of thumb, uh, they can indeed help to solve, uh, or at least make manageable, some of the pest problems that emerge. One technique that's applied uh, quite frequently this day and age in agroecology is intercropping. Intercropping is, is when you uh, grow two crops sort of in, comp in, in, in competition with one another, or uh, grow them together, similar to relay cropping, although relay intercropping means that the crop A and crop B, they grow in the same soil, but they're not at the same time in the same soil. Um, intercropping is similar to agroforestry, where one of the crops that you're growing happens to be a tree. Uh, companion planting is what a lot of gardeners um, uh, think about when they, uh, when they think of intercropping. Now, intercropping has uh, created a potential for uh, natural enemy control, potential for using nature to control, uh, to con excuse me, a pest control, using nature to somehow manipulate either the herbivores or the predators of those herbivores. So uh, <coughs> here you have an example of a, of a corn bean intercropped. And uh, remember the way insects see things, okay? This is an example of, uh, on, the, on the right, it's the way we see things, and on the left there is the way the insect might see them. Uh, so if you modify the basic picture there of the corn bean intercrop, this is you know, sort of something like what you might see. Now, uh, this is taking the you know, sight, that is visual, visual cues of light rays and, into account. But insects very frequently are chemically oriented, right? And, and the insect might be locating the corn plant, the corn, the, the corn pest might be locating the corn plant based on the odor of the corn plant. And now when you have all the odors of the bean plant around also, why uh, the herbivore might get really quite confused by the whole thing. Um, also, intercrops tend to attract natural enemies. Here are surfeit flies. Uh, surfeit flies, they pollinate uh, flowers, and when those flowers are the flowers of something that's been intercropped with corn or beans or whatever, why those flowers attract the, uh, the surfeit flies. And here you see a surfeit fly larva actually eating, uh, eating an aphid. So the larva of the surfeit flies are predators, the surfeit flies are pollinators, and obviously if you have an intercrop, and if you put an extra plant in with the crop that you're planting, well, you're gonna be potentially attracting these potential predators. Uh, this is a case where the, here's a case where we have the, the famous army worm uh, that, uh, that <coughs> attacks corn, but it also attacks, uh, it's a really major predator of tomatoes. Uh, in one experiment that uh, I was doing with a, with a colleague of mine, Peter Rossett, uh, in Nicaragua many years ago, well, we had a, a bean and tomato intercrop. And what we, <coughs> basically one day there was an invasion of these army worms, a huge, huge explosion of the army worms. And what happened was the, it turns out the army worms preferred the beans to the tomatoes. 
And so we had some plots that were beans and tomatoes together. We had some plots with just tomatoes and some plots with just beans. The ones that were just tomatoes were absolutely devastated, devastated by the army worms, but the one that had tomatoes and beans, all the army worms preferred the beans, and so they came into the beans. And so this is sometimes, this procedure is, this, this idea is sometimes referred to as a trap crop. Uh, <clears throat> you can have some, cro some crop that's there that kind of attracts, at a local level, attracts what the herbivore is, and, and then you can actually deal with that. Uh, some people actually spray that particular crop after the, after the herbivores, after the pests have come to that particular crop. So you have the situation where the herbivore is, has trouble finding the, the pr principal crop. Uh, then you have a situation where you attract, uh, attract natural enemies to the system. Uh, <clears throat> and and it, this is, this, these, these ideas have kind of been put together in a system that has become really quite popular now, especially, especially in Africa, but other places in the world too. It's called the pull-push system. So to summarize here, you have, uh, you have some crop that's, that, that's referred to as a trap crop. And in the trap crop, uh, what happens is the, the herbivores get into that trap crop, like the one that, like the army worms into, into the beans that I, in the example I just gave you, and they kind of stay there. And if you want, you can spray them, I guess. I don't recommend spraying, but that's part of the idea. And on the other hand, while you have the regular intercrop in there where things are coming and going uh, the way I suggested. Here's a recent study evaluating the push-pull system. Uh, here the maize grain yields were significantly higher in the, in the climate-adapted push-pull plots compared to the maize monocrops. Uh, <clears throat> uh, the majority, 89% of the push-pull technology practicing farmers rate the technology better than their, maize, their normal maize production methods. And here, this is the important point here, approximately 96% of the interviewed farmers were interested in adopting the technology. In other words, it's, a, it's a, it really a fairly, fairly complicated combination of things that agroecologists have been talking about for a long time in the context of intercropping. Now, <clears throat> sometimes, the way we control pests, even when we're successfully controlling the pests, sometimes the, um, the sort of intricate dynamics of the ecosystem can, uh, can become sort of perplexing. Uh, this is a particular case, for example. You have a, a leafhopper, uh, this leafhopper right here, that brings a viral disease to tomatoes. Okay? And in this particular uh, uh, experiment, this particular study, what, the peop what they did was they looked at the settling rates of these of these leafhoppers in organic production versus conventional production. And they found, as frequently one does, they found that the uh, organic production had a lower settling rate. That is, the leafhoppers um, were more actively settling and put, pu punching their noses into the, into the leaves in the tomatoes that were conventionally grown rather than the organically grown ones. However, <laughs> this particular study looked at a lot of the details. And here's their, 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 their summary of their results. Changes in leafhopper settling between organically and conventionally grown tomatoes are dependent on salicylic acid accumulation in plants and mediated by rhizosphere microbial communities. Okay. Now, it's good to understand that. It's good to know that that's the case. But when you look at that, what that suggests to us is that there's a lot going on there that we really don't understand. Um, you know, what do you mean by mediated by rhizosphere microbial communities. Now, microbial communities are themselves exceedingly complex things. Uh, we know there are rhizobial communities in both the organic and the conventional for, uh, conventionally fertilized system. So, you know, which, <laughs> exactly what is it about the biodiversity of the microbial communities in the rhizosphere that's actually resulting in this accumulation of the salicylic acid? Um, <clears throat> I'm not suggesting that, uh, that this means the study, there's something wrong with the study, not by, not by any stretch of the imagination. It's a great study, but it's a study that also points us in the direction of the need for further understanding. Uh, and that's one of my, uh, one of my pet projects. Uh, one of the reasons I actually teach this course, to try to convince people that we need to study this stuff more. So here we come to the end. And we have basically the two conclusions that, 
The new paradigm of autonomous pest management requires ecological knowledge, whether from traditional farming or the science of ecology. And secondly, the pesticide paradigm has a tremendous advantage since you really don't have to know anything other than this poison kills the creature. And that does it for this lecture. Uh, the next lecture will treat similar issues associated with the, the small uh, enemies of the, of the plants, which is to say the plant pathogens.